Welcome back to Beholder to One Shot. Today we are in here for an extra special spooky edition of the game. We are playing 5th edition, which normally we don't do for Beholder to One Shot, but we are doing The Belov. This is a story created by Asa Wheatley, and it's published in the Dungeon Masters Guild. And this is inspired by 1970s slasher films, Black Christmas, Halloween, and The Town That Dread Sundown. Now, personally, I've never seen any of those, but I am excited nonetheless for this spooky afternoon slash evening. Let's introduce everybody who is participating today. Some are familiar and some are new. So let's go with Ellen first. Hi, I'm Ellen Delina. You can find me on Twitter at Ellen underscore Delina or uh, GMing the Birdhouse Mysteries, a Savage Worlds actual play podcast at Birdhouse Myst, M-Y-S-T on Twitter. Uh, you could also find me doing various streams and I have links to those on my Twitter if you're interested. The um, most salient one for right now in spooky times is uh, Savage Ravenloft on uh, twitch.tv slash CFTRPG, which is a Savage Worlds rendition of Curse of Strahd. Um, uh, today I am playing... A very bright pink tiefling warlock, a celestial warlock of Pact of the Tome. She has a familiar who is an orange snake. His name is Nigel. And uh, she's just very cheerful. She has bright white hair and bright pink skin and going to be a very nice contrast with this spooky adventure. She sounds a lot a lot of fun. Tess, why don't you go next? Hi there. Uh, my name is Tess. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, I am one of the players on uh, Ellen's podcast, The Birdhouse Mysteries, so that's fun. I'm on Twitter at underscore not Felix, N-O-T-F-E-L-I-X, although I never use Twitter, so feel free to follow me, but you're not going to be getting much content. <laughs> Today I am playing Ditch, a drow uh, fighter barbarian. Uh, three levels of Battlemaster, Fighter, and two levels of Barbarian. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Ditch has, like, dark gray skin and bright pink hair and a magical battle axe, and it's going to be a lot of fun. It sounds like fun. Up next is Keith. Hello, I'm Keith. Uh, I play Seuss in our Behold Clearlight actual play, and... You can find me on Twitter at Keith underscore bits, although I don't really do a whole lot on there. Sometimes I go a little crazy with it, though. So um, other than that, that's about it. Today I'm playing Leto, a human ranger. Um, he's very full of himself. And that's all about he, about all he has going for him. Okay. And then finally, Prue. Hi. Yeah, I'm Prue. I am... At Poopy Pants everywhere online, if you imagine the word Poopy Pants and you just put an R after the first P, you'll find me. Um, I play on a Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition live stream that is on Thursday evenings um, with Chasing Tales. Uh, we are Chasing Tales pod in most places. If you want to find us on Twitch and give us a follow... We are chasing underscore tails, and the tails in that is spelled T-A-L-E-S, like stories and stuff. And today, I am playing a sweet, sweet little boy goblin paladin called Snotty, and I'm excited to do some spooky stuff. Awesome. Um, I will put all of the links to everything that was just mentioned down below, so please go check all of them out. And let's just jump right into love it is after sunset the first night that you arrive as you take your first steps into otkirk it is the silence that bothers you first the streets are empty lit only by faint oil lanterns hanging from cobweb ridden posts throughout the lanterns begin to swing softly in the wind the squeaking of their handles mimicking the pace of a heavy eternal heartbeat before you step in further you notice a wooden sign marking the entrance of otkirk once beautifully crafted, it has been worn down by the elements and vandalism. The sign now reads, Welcome to Otkirk, the home of the Belov. The word Belov has been carved into the wood over the sign, hiding its previous iteration. As you follow the stone path into the town, you spot a single building with a light emanating from its interior. A large hanging sign marks the building. It depicts a young woman as she sits atop a moor alone, distressed. 
Below the painting reads the lonely maiden, tavern and inn, longing for an ale and some respite you head inside. The lonely maiden is dimly lit by a collection of small oil lanterns and clusters of candles. As you enter, you see a single patron and barkeep within. The patron is an older human male. A circle of dirty gray hair sits atop of his head like a decrepit crown. His simple black clothes have numerous tears or tears and stains that even the dark material cannot hide. He sits at the bar with his head resting on his folded arms, intermittent snores filling the silence. The barkeep, a younger muscular human woman, leads, leans on the bar from behind it, reading a well-used book. She looks up confused, not expecting any more patrons for the evening, says, Good evening, folks. Evening. Hey there. Um, I'd love an ale if you got. Of course, uh, she will pour you an ale. It comes from a barrel that looks a little dusty and not well used, but it is ale nonetheless, and she gives it over with you, hand her over a copper for it. Do you have wine? No. Oh. Well, I, I, I guess I'll just take an ale then. Okay. She hands you an ale. I'll take two ales. She will pour you also some ale. And she looks over at um, Snotty. <laughs> Goodness, you all certainly look like your drinks, don't you? I'm a, I'm a man of the cloth. I uh, do not imbibe uh, alcoholic beverages in, into my body. I, I, I remain pure and good, but thank you. Will the rest of you enjoy yourselves. Um, do you have an orange juice? I got water. Uh, w- w- water will do just fine. Thank you. She will pour you some water. The water doesn't look the clearest, but it's water. He's a a goblin. He doesn't mind. He'll drink the dirty water. (laughs) (laughs) So as you guys uh, get your drinks and are brought over to a table, there is a man who seems to be sleeping on the bar and the noise of the other people stirs him awake. He looks up attempting to remember where he is and it's only after he takes a subconscious sip of ale that he realizes as he puts his tinkered back down on, on the counter, he notices the party and goes, ah, new friends. Bolivar uh, steps up off his stool, having to catch himself, his legs wobbling as he hits solid ground. He takes a couple of slow initial steps forward before he more confidently approaches your table. New to Otkirk, I see. Well, I have a tale for you. Bolivar sits with you and smiles, his black teeth, the few he has left anyway, revealing a stench worse than you thought possible. Another round for our new friends, Gert. I think it's time they hear the tale of little Charlie Wester. Do you guys do anything to stop him before he tells his tale? No, this is what I came here for. <laughs> I love stories, I say. But we don't need any more ale, we just got some. Hey, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Somebody wants to buy you an ale, you nod and say thank you. Does, does somebody else true. want my ale? You, you bought two the first time you bought them, you can you can have my one. Well, I will just reach over and pull it towards him. <laughs> So, Bolivar introduces himself, and he pulls a chair in front of your table and turns it around so he's straddling it, and he starts his tale. Little Charlie Wester had it tough from birth. A mere two days after he was born, his father was impaled on a pitchfork, in a freak accident, mind you. He grew up quiet and alone, only occasionally speaking a few words to his sister, Samantha, who was a year his senior. Bad luck seemed to follow good Charlie as he grew. The day after he found his way into Giles' truffed clumps cornfield, the crops began to die. When Charlie decided to play in the fountain in the square, they say the water bubbled and boiled the other children alive. As kids are wont to do, the children of Otkirk never let him forget it. They would gather outside the Wester family home and call out to Charlie, Belove, Belove, they would shout, an old slur for one cursed. Before too long, all of Otkirk called Charlie the Beloved, although for most it wasn't as openly as those hateful children. Years went by and the Westers kept to themselves. It wasn't until the death of poor Annie Kirsten, such a sweet little girl. You see, she was one of the few that held nothing against Charlie, but one afternoon when she had found her way independently to Charlie, a tragic accident befell her. The town's animosity could no longer be kept at bay, They marched to the Wester home and demanded the boy be handed to them for public execution. To them, he was a curse on the town, and they wanted rid of him. When his mother and sister were threatened with death, they gave Charlie up to the enraged crowd. Within hours, the boy was hanged in the square, and the town too late realized their brutality. 
The body was left to swing in the wind as the citizens of Otkirk dispersed, but when his mother and sister came to retrieve the body, it was gone. The noose, however, was still there. It's not tight. That day marked the death of Charlie Wester and the birth of the Bulav. Over the next year, there was rumors of a child in a crudely made mask ominously spotted throughout the town. It wasn't until the first death that the town began to worry. Throughout the year, there were four deaths, within the final two being that of Charlie's mother and sister as their house burned to cinders. It was between 25 years since he has hanged in this square. There are rumors that little Charlie Wester walks the land, lost, one day to return to Otkirk and take his vengeance. That's not the kind of story I usually like. Oh, that is my favorite kind of story. Yeah, I'm gonna need some more ale. That uh, sounds as uh, t- t- terrifying as uh, sp- spooky curses and whatnot. Uh. You said the body was gone before they came to retrieve it, but the noose was still there? That's what the stories say. Fascinating. Did the town take the noose down? I think they were too afraid to touch it, so I think it's still there. Oh no. I avoid the area, though. How long ago was uh, little Charlie still with us? How, how, how uh, old is this tale of yours? It's 25 years since he got hung. And how old was he when that happened? It couldn't have been more than 10. I don't honestly know off the top of my head. Mm. Goodness, 10, 10 years old. 10 years old, that's, that's not a lot of life for the poor little lad. It certainly is not. This is probably not the message I was supposed to get from that story, but I kind of understand why he would want vengeance. I mean, sure. I don't, I don't rightfully blame him. It's just a tale, though. Yeah, there are lots of things that, you know, are just tales, and yet, you know, life imitates art, so they say. Any tall tale can have its influence on the real world. As you guys are talking about this, Leto, you get caught up in the story, but it takes you a moment to realize that the faint whistling you hear in the background is not wind. It's screams of someone in peril. And they're getting louder, closer, and then they're gone. Uh, I think there's something going on outside. It might just be the ale talking, though. But I'm going to go check that out. What kind of something? I'm, I'm going to go with you. What kind of something? It sounded kind of like a scream, but I'm not sure. All right. As soon as, soon as he says scream, uh, Ditch is running for the door. Leto is just pulling off the huge crossbow that he has hanging on his back and just get it sort of ready but so as you are getting up and heading to the door and Leto is grabbing his crossbow there is a thump it startles you all as you turn to the source the door of the lonely maiden tavern shakes softly as it recovers you see Bolivar's eyes widen and his hand begins to shake as he whispers quietly to himself the Palav is home the Palav is home the what? The Balav. It's back. What's a Balav? That's the the specter of the little boy. All right, we are dealing with Uh, a spirit situation. Things that go bump in the night. Stick with me and we can handle this. I had a character. I honestly just was like, Keith, have you not listened to anything I just said? (laughs) Jesus. Um, uh, if, if, if you're going to be le- leading the charge, as it were, uh, l- let me offer you a little help. And I will cast protection from good and evil on Ditch. Yeah. Thank you. It lasts ten minutes, so, you know, if we don't encounter anything for the next ten minutes, oh well. I tried. <laughs> as you step out into the quiet night air, your eye catches something on the ground just ahead. It takes you a moment to focus. A severed human arm lies at your feet. Your eyes follow the blood trail deeper into the town, but before you can find the source, you notice something hurtling towards you. I need everybody to make a dex saving throw. Getting right in it. I have advantage on dex saves against effects that I can see because of danger sense. Okay. Uh, Oh, that's You can definitely see this. Well, I rolled a nat one and a nat two. Um... (laughs) So that's a four for me with advantage. (laughs) I got a 21. Okay. Leto got a natural one as well. And I got a seven. So only Vivid manages to dodge out of the way as a human body slams into all of you. Um, You are all knocked over. And as you start to push yourselves up, you realize, 
everybody but Vivid is covered in blood. Vivid's gonna shriek. Oh, so this is a fresh body. Uh, I just got this thing clean, too. Son of a bitch. Ditch feels good. Being covered in blood is, like, their preferred state. (laughs) What kind of body is it? Like, human or...? It is a human female. Can I, like, look around to try to see where the body came from? Um, You glance around and you see ahead of you, unmoving in the darkness, stands a shadowy figure, at least nine feet tall, with shoulders wide enough to block a doorway. The fog seems to coalesce around it. You see no real detail in its face, but you can feel its eyes glaring at you, taunting you. Can I cast Eldritch Blast at it? You can try. Okay. And she's doing this while shrieking. That is uh, 14 to hit. That will not hit. Yeah, so she's shrieking and uh, fires an Eldritch Blast, two beams, and they go wide. Goodness, Vivid, my child, you must remain calm. Did, did you get it? No! Didn't you see? It's right there. It's huge. Oh, God. All right. We're going we're gonna to settle this like adults. And Ditch is going to, like, walk straight up to the, the shadow. Shield on uh, one hand and battle axe in the other. All right. So as you walk closer, you see the a better v- vision of this person. It's a creature of great stature and presence. He wears simple and ragged cloth clothing. The cloth is dark and worn. In one hand, he holds a black iron morning star that drips with the blood of his previous victims. The most haunting element of his attire, though, is the crude mask he wears. Let me show you a picture. I can't show a picture for the people listening to the podcast, but it looks like... Imagine Jason's mask, but not a hockey mask made of, like, mud, almost. With two holes for eye and then a hole for the mouth. This is the natural conclusion of the um, clay face mask fad. (laughs) This is what happens when it goes too far. Alright, I will give you one attack and then he will respond. Wonderful. I will swing with my battle axe. Okay, that's a natural 19 plus 6, so 25. That will hit. Wonderful. Uh, and that is how much damage? That is 10 damage, because I'm not raging. All right, so as you reach up and you're using your battle axe, you said? Yes. Okay, so you rush forward to this creature and you get a closer look at their face and you realize it's a mask that he's wearing and you swing your battle axe at him and you seem to hit and then he raises his own hand and a figure seems to rush forward at you and I need you to make a wisdom save oh boy I'm great at this with my plus zero. Oh, that's a 17 as it rushes forward at you you momentarily are frightened and you stumble back a, f- a step just a step and you realize that it's just a f- it's a trick you're fine you're just like that's nothing but when you glance back up he's gone damn slippery spirit well, he's getting away from me. We will find you, and we will take care of you. Did you get it? Well, I hit it pretty good, but then went and disappeared on me. So, may take us a little longer to uh, neutralize the threat, as it were. I'm good at neutralizing things, so let's, uh... Is there any parts of him left behind where maybe they smacked him? Um, no. Ditch got a nick on them, but that's about it. All right, Leto's going to head back inside to the tavern and find the guy we were just talking to and ask him a couple questions about this thing that appeared. Okay, as you walk back in the tavern, you see Gert hovering over Bolivar, and Bolivar is on the ground where he fell before, shaking and rocking back and forth, just repeatedly saying, the Balav is home, the Balav is home. Gert will glance up at all of you and say, can can you guys, can you please go talk to the sheriff? Where can we find this sheriff? Uh, She will give you instructions on looking at the map. Um, If you go north past the the town square, it's right up there to like northeast of everything. Looking at the map, it's, um, you're at A1 currently and it's at A2. Cool. Yeah, Ditch will gladly head over to the 
sheriff's office. I feel like we ought to tell the sheriff about this this dead dead lady that we've still got out here. Before, you know. Uh, yeah. The the sheriff will know what to do. Yeah. Do you want to like say a prayer or something for that body so it doesn't turn into another one of these? Oh oh oh! Goodness goodness goodness! Yes yes yes! I will I will do a prayer. I I I I love my holy book. And he rootles around in his backpack and pulls out a very messy, very dog-eared, clearly extremely well-loved little holy book. And we'll say some last rites over this poor corpse of this lady before we head on. Okay, so you walk to the sheriff's office and you reach what looks to be a small hut. The soft light from inside illuminates the sign that hangs over the door. It reads Otkirk Law. The door stands ajar and you can hear muffled voices on the other side. As you step inside, you see the interior of Otkirk Law is as simple as its exterior. The oil lanterns hanging from either side of the room light the two desks that face each other in the center of the room. On the back wall hangs a map of Otkirk, which is the map I just shared with you. A middle-aged half-elf woman sits at one of the tables she is standing behind her desk, frantically flipping through papers. Her, uh, Ditch walks up. Hey there, uh, might you be the sheriff? She, like, looks up. She's like, what? Yes. Yes, 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 what? Hi, so, um, we were just down at the, uh, down at the tavern having a pint. No, uh, we heard some screaming, so we stepped outside, and, uh, a few of us were assaulted with a corpse. Uh, so that's out in the square right now. And then there was also a very large specter. With a, a big old bloody morning star that uh, I got a pretty good nick on it and then it disappeared. So there are some strange happenstances going on in your little town right now that uh, you might want to be appraised of. A- another death? Re- what? No, not why? Come on. Look, I. <sighs> she just like rubs the bridge of her nose. I don't know. I don't believe any of this crap about specters. There's a murderer out there though, and. I need to figure out what's going on because I have two killed up at Peckin Point and now you're telling me there's death over by the inn? Why? why, Like, it's been quiet for six plus months. What the hell? Now, I mean no disrespect at all, so please don't take this personal, but I find it astounding that people can sit here being, you know, we got elves, we got tieflings, we got goblins, we got magic spells and whatnot, but a, a specter's too much to believe? Yeah, you know, you know, magic, but you ain't, ain't have no ghosts. That doesn't make no sense to me. So I think, you know, the world is stranger than you'd like to believe. So just open your mind a little bit, and uh, perhaps you'll have better solutions to your problems. This is what it looked like. And I cast Minor Illusion and show a picture of uh, the big specter that we encountered. And Vivid kind of shivers as it appears. I think just one star immediately... was a little bit, a uh, little bit bigger than that. Just, just, just scale it up a little bit. Leto's just immediately going to grab his crossbow and just aim at it. The illusion. It's, like, not, oh, real. What? it's not real. You don't have to worry. God damn it! <laughs> Look, you got, you guys are new around here, and I appreciate you bringing it up to me. But can you please just go back to the inn? We will take care of this. I sent a guard to go get some backup. I need to go take care of the peaking point, and I'll send somebody out to come get the body over at the end. Just go back to the inn, and don't leave town, because uh, it's kind of suspicious that you get here, and then there's three deaths. Just saying. I appreciate the sentiment of, you know, you're the, the, the law bearer you want to you know, keep the town safe and leave us vigilantes to uh, mind our own business, but I find it hard to believe that you are going to take care of the problem if you refuse to acknowledge the nature of the problem itself. So, uh, respectfully, I'm not going to do that, and I'm going to find this, uh, this accursed specter, and I'm going to, uh, deal with it. We're real good at dealing with things. Please just go back to the inn. We will take care of it. We will find this culprit, Spectre or not. And we will deal with it. Give us a chance to do our job. We will pro- we'll have a meeting tomorrow to discuss what's going on in our new plans. 
didn't you just say that uh, this started about six months ago? I said we didn't have a murder until six months ago. Right, but you had one six months ago and it did not solve the problem. So uh, forgive me for finding it hard to believe that you're going to get it all done tonight if you couldn't get it done in the last six months. Well, I, it's probably not fucking related. It's been six goddamn months. You're the one who brought up the, the last one in reference to this one. So I'm just connecting the dots that you have laid out for me. She just, she just like rubs the bridge of her nose. And she snaps her finger and a guard from nearby, like, cautiously comes up to you, goes, please, uh, follow me. We'll go outside. Can I get a glance at the map before we get out of the sheriff's office? Sure, make a perception check to see how good of a glance you get. <laughs> That's not great. Or investigation. Ooh, I think I'm better at investigation. Yes, I'm a lot better at investigation. Um, 16? All right, you um, get a pretty good glance at it. You see a few spots that you um, want to know about. The one that caught your eye the most is the Wester family home. Okay. Because you remember that family, that is where, what was the fuck it was named? Charlie. Charlie. Bolivar. Oh. That's what Bolivar was saying, where Charlie lived. Okay. Do I also catch sight of Pecking Point? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and Vivid says thank you <laughs> as we are escorted out of the sheriff's office. Yeah, I want to say to the the guard who is escorting us out. Um, now, how do you feel about about this uh this spectral hubbub? I heard the stories, and they're they're terrifying. And if they are true. I don't know why he's still attacking us. Um, I don't. I don't rightfully know what to what to think, but I know that the sheriff Sheriff Sophia is just under a lot of stress right now. Can I do an insight check on him when he says he doesn't know why the ghost would be back? Or, or yeah, that's fine. Now? Cool. Oh no, bad nine. He doesn't seem to actually know. He seems pretty young. Mm. So he might be either... For him, it might still just be a fable or a story tale. But you're not 100% sure. Cool. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate you uh, you know, taking the time to escort us back to the inn. Um, feel free to tell your boss that we will be staying you know, where she told us to, even though we will not. Um, and, uh, I hope you have a pleasant evening and do not get murdered by a nine-foot ghost with a morning star. I appreciate that. Um, can I at least take you to the inn so I can say I did it so? You can walk really yourself. You can walk yourself to the inn so that you can say you went to the inn and take a realistic amount of time walking back to, uh, back to the law office from the inn, uh, but we will not be accompanying you. Oh, oh come now, ditch. Have a, have a little faith, you know? We can, we can trust these people. Oh, we probably need to go back to, back to the tavern anyway, because it's the only place you've seen this spooky monster you're trying to kill, so we should, we should stay with this lawman. And do what, do what he says. Uh, you, you're a good lad. And I'll reach up with my little goblin hand and pat him on the back of the hand. Uh, respectfully, Snotty, uh, we cannot trust everything these townsfolk say. Uh, we do not know what sort of involvement they had in why this ghost is here, calls it a fuss, making a ruckus. So, uh they're gonna do all they can to obfuscate their own culpability so it is on us as you know objective outside observers to take everything they say with a grain of salt i agree let's go kill some monsters all right thank you guard he just throws up his hands in defeat and like walks towards the end um so i got a look at the map so I don't know if we want to go to Pecking Point and see if we can look at these other murders that happened, or if we want to go to the Wester family home. Um, I don't particularly want to because that sounds horrifying. 
but it's possible that that would be the best place to go to try to find this spooky specter or at least some clues vivid my friend i would love nothing more than go into the wester family home and if you stick near me i will make sure you do not get hurt that you is know, a I, promise i appreciate that so you guys are going to the home i believe so yeah ditches uh, whether or not anybody wants to come with them is uh, another story is anybody following ditch vivid's gonna follow yeah letter will follow as well uh, Snotty definitely stands in the street looking between the guard and the party and the guard and the party and is like, oh, well, goodness gracious, and follows, follows the party. As you guys are having this discussion, Snotty, because you are looking and following the path of the guard, you see leaning against a building behind or in the direction of the guard, a woman, a young human woman, on the edge of the square looking in. She has an intense look on her face and half blocked by a shock of scarlet hair. A stone necklace hangs from her neck and with some kind of symbol carved into the stone, but you don't recognize it from the distance. As you look at her, the woman turns and looks directly at you. Her eyes pierce into you and you are frozen for a moment. You glance to see the guard once more and when you look back, she's gone. Hi, guys. Oh, sorry. Uh, 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 hey, 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 guys. I, uh, oh, my legs are in a little. It takes a while to catch up with you. Um, there, there, there was a lady. Did you see the lady? The spooky one. I did one. not. Uh, can you describe this lady to me, please? Um, yes. Um, she, she had uh, bright red hair, all flopping over one eye, big, big stone necklaces with, with, with things carved on, her, and, and she looked right into my soul, the way, the way God Himself looks into my soul, and it was, it was terrifying. Sent, sent chills right over me. And did you see w- what she was doing or where she went? Oh, she, she just looked at me right spooky, like. Just, it was, it was just, you know, you've been looked at all spooky like tonight. Well, I've also been looked at all spooky like tonight. It's all a bit suspicious. Understood. So we are adding red hair stone necklace lady to the list of specters to keep an eye on. Got it. Thank you for reporting that snotty. And uh, hopefully you won't get no more uh, spooky like looks tonight. Okay. So you guys start heading to the Western family home. It's easy enough to find. It sits in a street towards the northwest of the town that's no longer inhabited. Because it's still night, there aren't many citizens currently in the streets. As you make your way further into the street, you can instantly see the Wester home, a decrepit shell of the family abode that is once was. Its walls black from raging fire years before. The wind whistles through the house, filling your nostrils with a deep smell of old burnt wood. There is a door that opens up to the entrance. Can I do like a perception check just to see if there's any one or thing lurking around? Sure. Ooh, 22. The streets are silent and you do not see any of the specters that have been mentioned or seen previously. Wonderful, then I am going inside the house. Okay. I'm just going to take a look around the house and just see if there's anything odd about it. Other than the fact that it was probably haunted and burnt down. You walk through the main entrance and in the central room, not much remains. Blackened walls line the insides of the Wester family home. A set of broken and burnt stairs lead up to the large empty second level. It's only then that you realize the flooring beneath your feet used to be on that of the upper level. There are the charred remains of doors on both the east and west walls in the former central room. Intermittent sounds and a soft blue light comes from the room to the west. You, you see that light, right? Yes, I do, and I'm going right for it. Be careful, Ditch. Thank you, Vivid. I reach out a hand and cast Guidance, so you get to add a d4 to some kind of check that you make. Thank you. All right, so you go to the western door with the light? Yes. You reach the door, and when you open it, from within this room, a blue light emanates. As you step closer, you can see the blue floating image of a woman dressed in simple clothes, moving from one counter to the other. It seems at first she is too preoccupied to notice you until she suddenly stops. 
Her head slowly turns, and she lets out a horrific screech as she rushes towards you. The spirit form washes over you as the blue light fades, and before you can react, she is gone, dispersed into the air around you, an echo of a once-loving mother. Is there anything else uh, noteworthy in this room? Um, it's a kitchen, and most of it has been destroyed, but nothing seems to like scream out at you other than the ghosty that just screamed at you. Hmm, okay. And we all saw that, right? Everybody who was behind Ditch would have seen, heard the scream and then seen some, like, the blue light get closer. I will say that Ellen, or Vivid, saw it because of your passive perception. You saw the details. Everybody else saw something but didn't specifically get details. Oh my god. This town has so many ghosts. Why did we come here? I know why we came here. We came here to take care of the ghosts. But this is horrible. Vivid, I promised I would take care of you, and I am going to make good on that promise. I appreciate that. I'm just reacting, and my feelings are such. Your feelings are real and valid, and I appreciate them, but dang, if you can have faith in your gods, you can have a little faith in me, please. Okay. And she, like, kind of, uh, pets Nigel, the snake, on her arm to, like, comfort herself. Oh, Ditch fully also pets Nigel. (laughs) <laughs> so while they're having this conversation, Leto and Snotty, are you going to be doing anything? Uh, Leto will probably just start casting protection from evil and good on himself after hearing that and all the other craziness going on. It's like, there's something here. I'm sure we've all realized that, though. Snotty isn't doing anything in particular. Um, just clutching his little holy symbol and muttering lots of prayers quietly under his breath. Okay, so there is the eastern door, or there is a small room off of the kitchen. Oh, if I'm already in the kitchen, I want to go in the small room first. Okay. Off the kitchen, this small room would have been where the family will wash, would have washed themselves and their belongings. Of all the rooms, it is the one that remains most intact while still covered by the black ash that fills the home. Any, not even just like, are there ghosts in here, but is there anything that like, seems weird or out of place or anything that is like conspicuously clean compared to the rest of it no it just it looks less charred than the rest of the house Mm. all right if it doesn't seem like there's anything of note in there then uh i'm good okay so to the east of the living room you find a room that seems to have been a bedroom Overtoned bookcases and burnt beds are all that remained of the rooms. Can I get someone to roll an investigation check? I will. Can I give Vivid the help action? Sure. Okay, cool. Ooh, uh, 24. Leto got a 20. A 30, 20. Okay. Both Leto and Vivid, you see a hidden door that has some strange glowing symbols engraved onto them underneath one of the burnt remains of the bed. Ooh, I have eyes of the rune keeper, so I can read all writing. Does it, is it like writing or can I understand what it says? It looks like it is a magic seal. There's some kind of seal over here? Um, while Vivid is looking at that, Leto, you find a journal underneath the other bed. All right, I'm going to pick it up and start opening it up and start reading through it. Okay. Um, so f- first we'll focus on the journal. You're reading through it and it looks like it belonged to Sam Wester. This contains basic information about the Wester family, but it also chronicles the descent of Charlie Wester. Charlie was quiet initially, but as you read through further, 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 he became even more quiet. He created himself a hollow knight's mask and necklace, gifting one to Samantha. This was the last time he spoke. He was killed wearing the mask. There's a this journal here. It talks about Charlie and yeah, he made himself a mask and a necklace for his sister. Does it describe the necklace? Does it describe the necklace at all? Uh, there is a little drawing of the stone necklace that Snotty saw. Yeah, I was just going to ask. It, it, it kind of looks like what you described uh, the other chick's necklace to be. Oh, 
Goodness, yes, you're right. It is, it's, it's, the, it's the very same. It's the very same one. How how coincident? Oh, oh. Do you think sh she was Sam? Yeah, I'm thinking we got uh, all three of them. We got haunting this place. We got uh, Charlie with that morning star. We got uh, Samantha wearing the necklace out in the square, and we got a uh, dear old mom screaming at me in the kitchen. I I don't I don't. <sighs> I might not have heard the story right, but I don't think Samantha's dead. And the person I saw in the square look, look they could have been corporeal, they could have not been. You know how ghosts can be sometimes. No, the the story made it pretty clear that uh, the mom and the sister were the last two to die in the first string of deaths when the house burned down. Oh, oh, I'm not, I'm not very, very good at remembering things. Oh, thank you. You're glad you're here. But, but wouldn't. The sister have been younger then? And you described a woman, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, well, Charlie also died at 10 years old, and yet that specter was, you know, at least mid-30s and nine feet tall. So, you know, things can be a little different. It's been 25 years. True. Yeah, specters can have weird effects on uh, poor folk like these. I mean, the DM might have also fucked up on the age. <laughs> yeah, or God, God might have messed up. I think it's much... I, I think it's much funnier if they just continued to age normally after death. I just think that that's really funny. That's like, fair. no, I'm dead, but I still went through puberty. <laughs> <laughs> sure, let's go with that. A crackling voice ghost in his 17s or 14s. Ugh, I have ghost acne. Don't look at me. <laughs> acne. <laughs> it looks like they keep hot in this town that... Is it family business? Vivid, you hear stairs creaking, or a door creaking outside. Um, I just heard a door creaking. Uh, didn't seem to be inside the house. You know, the wind in the, these old buildings. I'll go check it out. Wait, before you go, I'm, I'm, I am, I am, I will be lying if I didn't say I was a little bit frightened. Look, look, you, you all take a take one of these, and I hand out these little strips of white cloth. And the, the these all uh, these all uh, uh, bolster you up with toughness and resolve. Make you, I know, I know you're already very strong, but it'll make you even even stronger with a uh, with my God on your side. Um, and I'm gonna cast aid. Um, the spell bolsters allies with toughness and resolve. Everybody gets five temporary hit point. No, your hit point maximum increases by five uh, for the duration, and the duration is eight hours. Oh, wow. Very cool. Thank, thank you very much, Snotty. I greatly appreciate it. I feel a lot safer now. Thank you. I'm going to go out and, and check out the noise. As you walk out of the room, you see the redhead that was described earlier by Snotty standing in the doorway. Her eyes are wide as she sees you and she's like I, I, I thought I, I thought I saw you guys come in here. Um, Would you be the uh, prodigal Samantha? Y yes. H how do you know my name? Hi there. My name's Ditch. Uh, yeah, we got told a little story about the family that used to live in this home. Uh, we were told that uh, there was a, a young woman Wearing a, a necklace, much like the one you have around your neck right there. She places her hand on the necklace and uh, seems to... I mean, roll an insight check really quick. Uh, 18. She seems saddened. Like, she holds it and, like, clutches it. Kind of like she's remembering um, who gave it to her. And she goes, yeah. The, the story keeps saying that... Some of the versions say that I died, but I, I didn't. I got out. My mom, not so much. I, I think Charlie died here, too. I don't I know why they keep blaming him. Yeah, but... from from what I heard, sounds like he was a victim and all this. I mean, you know, you peg a child as cursed from literally birth and then, you know, treat him like a monster. What do you expect to happen? It's the thing is, it's not it's not Charlie. It's the it's the Belov that's doing this. Charlie's still in there. In where? In the house? In him in the being, the specter, the creature, I don't know what to call him, but the Belov is not Charlie. He 
when he came here to to set fire to the house i called out his name and he hesitated he stopped and that's how i was able to escape and then the blob took over again but he's still in there my brother is still in there oh goodness it looks like we maybe have a, a case for an exorcism on our hands um so it's a good job you've uh, s- s- sort us out we've got a h- holy folk among us and i will give her a wide and probably quite horrible goblin smile she shudders a little bit she goes i i go by penelope now i i use this as a way to fake my death so that I could not be questioned further about what was happening. I I thought Charlie was gone and then he keeps reappearing with this Balav. I I don't know what... I don't know what was happening, but that mask and this necklace all happened like shortly before in the last couple of months before everything, the fire, and... I'm sorry, I'm not making any sense. No, no, that's alright. You've been through some uh, traumatic experiences. Nobody can blame you for being a little out of sorts. So, I've got a, a question for you. Um, if if the stories are to be believed, the, the fire and, and all the whatnot uh, with your brother happened about 25 years ago? Is that correct? Uh, yes. Right. Is there a reason that um, some things might uh, be reoccurring now, all all this time later? Perhaps because it's Hallow's Night. Had have these things been happening in the previous twenty four Hallow's Nights? There was one or two, but to this maybe one per year. This year has been the worst. Um, three, if I've heard correctly. But it was always said to be a drunk who did something, or a traveler visited and got in a fight, and it was never, it was never placed upon the rumors. Uh, Sheriff Sophia, she doesn't believe in in ghosts. In well, I don't think it's Charlie. I do think, I do think the beloved is it responsible. Yeah, I had uh, I had some words with uh, your dear sheriff. Uh, not too long ago about uh, being more open-minded to the preternatural. So, for what it's worth, I do believe you. May I look at your necklace? Um, she says, sure. Um, and she carefully takes it off. She's like, just be careful. This is all I have left of him. And she hands it over. I'm going to cast Detect Magic. Use one of my two spell slots that I get as a warlock. I mean, you could can't you cast it as a ritual? Oh, I can! Yes! That's true. It'll take, um, but then it'll take, uh... Ten minutes. Ten minutes. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, so I stand there for ten minutes, like, casting it as a ritual, and, uh, I say, there's also that seal over there. Magic seal? Do you know anything about that, uh, Penelope? Yeah, there's a door back there. She will look like she's remembering, because it's must have been ages she's like i haven't been here in so long um i know that he gifted me this necklace and i asked him but he wouldn't he didn't tell me what what it was for he just said that i could use it to protect me one day but didn't go further into detail he said it unlocked something that would protect me or unlock something that i could use to possibly help well we have a a warded door and a necklace that possibly unlocks something. I, I think there's a connection here. I mean, probably. He was smart. I'll give him that. He did used to disappear for hours, so that would make sense if he just went to through the door. I, I never thought much of it. You never thought much about a magically warded door in your house? When you have a brother as strange as mine, you don't ask many questions. That's fair. While I'm doing this ritual, can I take the necklace over to the seal? Sure. Uh, she will follow you hesitantly um, as you watch her like eyes begin to water. She's glancing around the home for the first time in 25 years. 
Yeah, I want to be, like, right up next to the door in case anything pops out. As uh, Vivid finishes casting her Detect Magic, you can tell that the only spell on the necklace is that to make it a key. And when it's placed near the door, there is a click. The wooden board begins to fade away, revealing a overused rickety rope ladder that leads down into darkness. I'm climbing. <laughs> Ditch is just fucking going. Not even gonna bother. Well, I mean, I do have pretty good dark vision, so I would love to, like, just do, like, a real cursory sweep as I begin climbing. Wait! I say, and I cast light on your shield. Oh. oh thank you very much, Vivid. Well, before we go in, I want to make sure nothing follows us in there. There's some weird stuff going on in this town, and I don't trust it. Leto's gonna start setting up an alarm around the room that we're in. Um, as you guys are doing this, Penelope will reach up and go, C- can I Can I go with you? It's probably going to be dangerous. I, I want to know what's happening. I want to know what's going on. I want to help my brother be Charlie again. I will do my best to keep you safe. So you are welcome to come along. As long as I'm, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, anybody else is welcome to, to veto that decision, but I don't think they will. I mean, probably better here with us than with those guards out there. I mean, if she does have some sort of connection to this thing, then I'll probably be coming after her. So when you look down... You see bones scattered across the ground. There doesn't seem to be anything dangerous just looking down them. So do you climb down? Yes, I do. When you reach the bottom, something cracks beneath your step. You look down and you find the bones that you just saw. The tunnel appears to have been carved out of the earth below the Wester family home with bare hands. The walls rough to the touch, It takes you a moment to notice, but there's something wrong with the light here. Despite you not needing it because of the light spell, the torches all hold black flames, and they light the tunnels with shadows. At the cusp of the flame's light, you can see an opening into some kind of crudely formed room. Fascinating. Um, can I do like an arcana check or something to see what's up with these lamps? Or with these torches? Oh no, bad five. You do not know. Cool. Then, yeah, I'm gonna- I- Ditch is heading towards the room. Is everybody following? Yes. Yep. Um, I think Snotty's like, wait, 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 um, let me- let me get up front with you, and I will cast, uh, Detect Good and Evil as we're, like, going down this corridor and towards this spooky room, um, and that just gives me information on- certain types of creatures so if there is a celestial elemental fey fiend undead or aberration within 30 feet i will know that they're there and where that creature is located or if somewhere has been consecrated or desecrated within 30 feet i will know that good to know let me read ahead just to make sure is it within 30 feet you said yeah within 30 feet for the next 10 minutes so if we walk anywhere th- in, within 30 feet of me, there's any of the spooky stuff. Little snot, you'll get a tingle at the back of back of his neck or something. All right. Um, as you walk to the front um, and you guys are moving forward, this crudely formed room holds the few essentials a person would need to live. Scraps of food, dead animals torn to shreds rest in one corner next to a blanket, frayed at all sides. The light in here gives off a more orange glow, but it's somehow dimmer than that of the tunnel before it. More disturbingly, in the center of the back wall sits an altar of skulls and bones. Torn black cloth caught in the bones flutters in the soft winds that whip through the room. Above the altar on the wall, drawn in blood, sits the same symbol that features on the stone necklace and trapdoor. Does it look like it's recently been used at all? Like, is the scraps of animal fresh, or has it been there for ages? Uh, make a survival check, and then Snotty make a religion check. 
Oh no, Snot, Snotty's religion check was very bad. It was a five. I got a 17 on survival. Um, the animal carcasses, some look fresh, sure. I think somebody's been here recently. If anybody else has religion, they can also roll. I do not. I do not. Okay. Is it, um, would Snotty's spell know if it's desecrated? Uh, I don't even know what desecrated means off the top of my head, honestly. Just like, uh, unholy. Oh. Um, I don't think it would be unholy. I mean, it looks like a shrine. Well, with my poor religion check, I think stupid little snotty's gonna be like, Oh, this place is an unholy place. It gives me the (laughs) (laughs) heebie-jeebies. Are there any, like, other points of egress to this room? Like, secret tunnels we can look for? Or, like, false panels? Or, like, even, like, a little crack in the wall or something? No, there's just, um, the way you came in. Okay. And, uh, Penelope, you said you did not know that this was here, right? I've never been down here before. Can I insight that? Mm Mm-hmm. Fourteen. She seems to be telling the truth. Okay. Uh, Snotty, you sense undead above you. Uh, oh, goodness, everyone, there's something undead above us. Be wary, and maybe d- draw your weapons. And he pulls out his little uh, war hammer. There is the sounds, as Snotty is speaking, there's the sounds of footsteps thudding on the ceiling above you. And then moments later, you hear the sound of water dousing flames as if a torch was dropped into a well. When you are all looking towards the tunnel, you see the flames ahead of you begin to go out, each one sequentially dissipating into the darkness until the tunnel is pitch black. You still have the light on your shield, though. All right, everybody get behind me. As long as I've got my battle axe, nobody within 30 feet of me can be surprised. If you want to survive, just make sure uh, I am between you and whatever spirit this is. So I'm gonna go like s- stand kind of close to the um, the the doorway, I guess, uh, with my shield up and my battle axe out. Penelope, get in the corner. Uh, she listens and goes into the farthest corner, away from the carcasses. All right. I am going to have everybody roll initiative, so this will be easier to track on who is going where. Oh, bad. With my advantage on initiative, I got a 12. <laughs> I got a 7. I also got a 7. Um, I got a 19. Who has the higher decks between Leto and I have 18 decks. Uh, you do. Okay. And then the blob rolled something. I don't like that. I don't <laughs> like. I don't like just a something. I do that sometimes to you guys. I know. I know you do. <laughs> Ditch. What's your dex? Plus two. Okay. Snotty, you are up first as you see a creature start to walk through. Um, or you don't see the creature, but you he, know that the creature is in the tunnel. Um, Snotty, like, um, fumbles with one hand at his at the front of his, like, vestments and chainmail and pulls forward a holy amulet and um, is going to channel divinity, turn the unholy. Um, he presents his holy symbol and speaks a prayer against the undead. And uh, if the creature is a fiend or undead, it must make a wisdom saving throw. If it fails a saving throw, it will be turned for a minute. I am also realizing this might annoy Ditch, because if it fails the saving throw, it's just going to have to run away. And I don't think Ditch will want it to run away. I'm sorry. No, I mean, <laughs> it's not what they'd prefer, but... Like, it's fine, and I feel like they've been traveling with Snotty long enough that they know that, like, yeah, they're a paladin, they're gonna do this. Cool. Alright, so, 
naughty. I have to make a wisdom save? Yes. How good am I at wisdom? What's my DC? Uh, it's a 13. I rolled a 13. Okay, that is uh, a success. So I present this little holy symbol, like, oh, the power of uh, my, my holy lord com- compels you to step back, beast! And uh, it doesn't work. And <laughs> snotty as a bonus action will cast Sanctuary, because um, the first thing I cast wasn't a spell. Um, and I think I will cast Sanctuary on um, uh, Vivid. Ooh. If I can reach Vivid. Yes, I definitely can. Yes. Um, so basically, if the creature tries to attack you, Vivid, it has to make a wisdom saving and try and attack someone else. That's a concentration? It is actually not a concentration. Okay, cool. Good to know. Thank you. No worries. Is that your turn? Uh, yes, I'm not going to move. I feel like I'm in a good position. Itch. It is your turn. Wonderful. Uh, for a bonus action, I'm going to fly into a rage. And then I am going to hold an attack for if this thing uh, gets within five feet of me. Because um, I don't want to get too far away from the rest of my friends because then I can't protect them. Okay. So I am I am raging, and I am waiting to strike. All right. So as you ready yourself in stance for preparing for battle, you see, you see a creature that you've seen earlier walk into the room out of the shadows. He lifts his hand up and. Again, that vision that you Ditch saw earlier that rushes for him. It looks like he just rushes straight at you. I need you to make another wisdom save. Not good. That's a nine. Okay. You are cursed. Oh, what does that mean? You can act as normal, but at the start of your turn, you must roll a d12. If you roll a 12, you are frozen in fear, stunned until the start of your next turn. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, There are some extra things to it, but that's the biggest thing right now that affects you. Cool. Did this thing get within five feet of me in order to do that? No, he is 15 feet away from you. Uh, That is the other stuff that happens. I just sent it. And there is a picture of the map, and that is his turn. Up next is Leto. All right. I'm going to pull up my crossbow and aim it right at his face. Well, what I can see of his face. And I'm going to study him a little bit and use my hunter sense and learn if he has any immunities, resistances, vulnerabilities, or if divination magic works on him or not. How long does it take to do that? It's an action. Okay. He does not have any immunities or resistances or anything like that. And what was the other one? Uh, vulnerabilities or if he's protected from divination magic. No and no. Okay. Cool. And then I am going to, as a bonus action, I'm going to mark him as my prey. My Slayer's prey. Which gives me extra damage when I hit him. Okay. And that'll be it. Up next is Vivid. Okay. As a bonus action, I'm going to cast Hex on the Bulov. So... Sanctuary ends if you cast a spell that affects an enemy. Just yeah. So you know. I mean, I was going to do it anyway. Alright, I'm just making sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, And I think he just does that, right? Like, Hex is just a thing that happens. Yep. Yeah, you place a curse. Yeah, okay. So that is for an hour. So I deal 1d6 necrotic damage to the target whenever I hit it with an attack. So as my action, I am going to cast um, Eldritch Blast at it. Okay. So that is... Ooh! That's pretty good. Uh, that is 17 on the die, so 25 to hit. That will hit. Okay. Ooh, I got a 10! 
this for Savage Worlds, I'd be re-rolling it. Um, that is uh, 18 points of damage. Oh, plus my d6. I already forgot that. Six, so um, 24 points of damage. And he's going to have disadvantage on, let's do wisdom checks, I think. So you do get two uh, bolts. So you yes, roll. I did. I did. Um, do I have to roll separately for both of them, or? I believe so. Oh, okay. Then I did that wrong. So it's then subtract three of the damage, and I'll roll for the other one. Okay, so that's nineteen to hit for the second one. Okay, that'll hit. Okay. And then uh, five. So it was actually more damage than before. So you did how much for the first attack? Twenty-four. Uh, n- uh, twenty-one. And then five. Okay. Fantastic. Is that your turn? Yes. Snotty. You see um, Vivid reach up and shoot two bolts of necrotic energy at the creature, and it hits him strong, but it's still up. Um, I would like to just uh, charge at the Belov uh, with my Warhammer and try and hit it. Um, I'll try hit it twice. Okay. Oh no, they were both pretty bad rolls. Uh, a 15 and an 11. Both of those miss. Yeah, okay. So um, you rush up with your morning star and swing and he manages to dodge out of the way. Um, as you whiff and hit the air. Oh no. Um, I'm going to stay there though. And I'm not going to take any bonus action, so I'm all good. I'm done. Okay. Ditch, it is your turn. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to run up. Um, I want to keep Snotty within five feet of me because I'm a protection fighter. Um, I'm and a protection then... fighter too. We can look after each other. Oh, that's so cute. Um, so I'm gonna make my one attack with my battle axe, and I rolled a twelve, so that's not gonna hit. Nope. And I only get the one attack because I multiclassed, so uh, I guess that's my whole turn. Damn. All right. So on his turn, he will, now that he has two targets directly in front of him, he will swing his morning star at one of you. Sorry, I'm trying to understand this stat block and it is not great. <laughs> They do not have the actual rolls for his attacks for some reason. Alright, first he is going to... I'm going to roll a d6 to determine who he hits. Uh, one, two, three, he is going after um, Ditch. Uh, four, five, six, he's going after Snotty. He's going after Ditch. He is going to reach out and try to grasp you. This is a move he has called Throttle. I'm pretty sure that misses though. Um... I will just say, as a protection fighter, um, if this is something that is him making an attack roll, I will wield my shield to try and protect um, Ditch and um, yeah, that gives disadvantage on the attack roll. Okay, I'm pretty sure it missed either way, but good to know. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, their armor class is 16. Oh, then I just hit, so let me re-roll to see if I miss. I do miss. I rolled a 3 on the second roll. So he goes to grasp a uh, ditch and is unable to grasp onto your armor. So instead, it swings his Morning Star at you. The first attack 
was a two. Second attack is a... Do all attacks have disadvantage or just one? Um, It's just the, just the one. Yeah, it's just the one. Okay. Yeah. So the third attack is a 19. Yeah, that hits. I will say, the reason that he had trouble grabbing onto my armor is I'm not fucking wearing armor. That's fair. <laughs> Grab onto your shirt. Um, my overalls, no! <laughs> <laughs> you take 11 damage, half to 5. Since you are raging. That's just my... That's literally just my aid hit points. I'm back at my max. <laughs> yeah. So that is his turn. So Leto, it is your turn. He goes to grasp a ditch and pull them forward, but isn't able to grasp one. Instead, just swings the Morning Star twice. Ditch easily able to dodge out of the way. What are you doing? Uh, with my crossbow still up from studying him earlier, I am going to just shoot straight at him. Uh, I'll be taking a attack penalty to get some extra damage in with my sharpshooter feet. That'll be a 16 to hit. That'll miss. Okay. Uh, second attack, I'll reload my crossbow and shoot at him again. 20 of it. That will hit. Cool. Maybe 20 damage. 20 damage, Jesus. Um, so I did find the Morning Star information finally. For some reason it's not where it's supposed to be. It was a plus you morning star so it would have done one more damage to you cool cool Ooh. <laughs> oh, damn. is that your turn yeah that would be his turn he's not gonna do anything else okay up next is vivid vivid is going to cast eldritch blast again but she is going to move uh forward diagonally to the right and then up one space so that she has a better line of sight. So that she can shoot in between Ditch and Snotty. Mm -hmm. So the first Eldritch Blast is 18 to hit. And that will hit. Okay. Uh, ooh! Oh, that's a six. Okay. Um, that's 20 plus my hex is four. So 24 on the first one. You guys are ridiculous. <laughs> um, and then... Ooh! Uh, 27 to hit. That'll hit. And my second one is... Uh, 11 plus... Oh, uh, 16 damage. Okay. Um, he looks pretty hurt. And these are also bright pink bolts of Eldritch energy that go flying at him, so just imagine that. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, glowing a little pink right now. And that's my turn. Alright, he is looking bloodied. Up next is Snotty again. Um, I'm just gonna go for two more hits with my Warhammer. Okay. Do -do -do -do. Um... A, a nat 20 and a nat 1. <laughs> Would you believe? Um, so I'm guessing one of those uh, snotty swings out and misses, but the other one... Uh, can I put Divine Smite on it? You can. I will pop a Divine Smite on it to get that juicy extra damage. Um, he is undead. So... so I, that does extra damage on top of that. Yeah, mm. so it's... 2d8 plus 1d8 for undead, so it's 3d8, but it's a crit. So I guess it's 6d8, which is silly. Um, it's amazing. 6d8, and then the Warhammer is 1d8 on its own, so that so, goes up. So it's 8d8. D8. Yes. I was just calling them all so that you weren't thinking I was being a cheater. <laughs> no, it's ridiculous, yeah. 
Um, 39 damage on that hit. Very nice. He is not a happy person. Or dead thing. And that's all I'm going to do for now. Okay. I'm all done. Ditch. You are yeah. being one-upped by Snotty right now. Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, on me for forgetting uh, my abilities. I'm going to swing recklessly this time so that I get advantage. Um, means he'll have advantage against me, but that's fine. Um, and that's going to be a 22 to hit. Uh, so I think that probably hits. Um, it does. We have been forgetting to do your d12 thing. Oh, shit. Sorry. No, that's my bad. I forgot. I rolled an 11. <laughs> okay, so you are good. Um, Should I retroactively so... roll for the last turn, too? I mean, I didn't hit the last time anyway. Well, it's, it's fine if you didn't hit. Okay. So, additionally, the caster can use a reaction when a target attempts to attack them to reduce the attack by a number equal to the caster's intimidation bonus. Um, so, I'm going to do that, which will lower your roll by 10. So I got another fucking 12. <laughs> yes. I... <sighs> okay, then I'm gonna action surge. Use my one action surge and try again. Okay. Also recklessly. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a 23. Can they do that this again? <laughs> Well, that was their reaction. Okay, um, good. Perfect. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and then I'm also gonna make this a goading attack. Uh, so I'm expending one of my superiority dice to add a d8 of damage, and it has to make a wisdom saving throw. And it uh, has disadvantage on those. Or is it just checks? I think it's just what checks it? for Never mind. Hex, not saves. Never mind. Um, you rolled a 15. Okay, yeah, the DC was uh, 14. Um, it was just to uh, give him disadvantage on attacking anybody but me. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that is uh, 14 damage for me. Okay. And that's it, I, yeah. I use my action and my action surge, and I'm not gonna move. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right. He is going to attempt to grasp Snotty this time. I'm gonna use my reaction to impose disadvantage with my shield. Okay. Me and Snotty just shoving our shields in front of each other. <laughs> Love protection fighting so. style. Um, that's a 13. A 13 misses. Fantastic. So then it will swing its morning star at Snotty. No, little Snotty. Actually, no. What it's going to do... Yeah. It's oh shit, be... sorry. There should have been two more damage on my thing, because I forgot that I was raging. Okay. Sorry. You're fine. So that is a natural 20 against Snotty. Uh, and that 20 does hit. The Morning Star lodges into you. And it is going to expend two charges for this item. So it's going to do normal oh. damage, but it's also going to do something else. So that is uh, 18 piercing damage. Mm-hmm. And I need you to make a constitution saving throw. Uh, oh, that's only a 12. That will fail. You take an additional 7 damage as the spikes lodge themselves into your body. Ow. Ow. And they explode. Double ow. Um, and then its second attack is a 25. Mm hmm Yes, that will hit. And this time, you take 9 points of damage, 
And as the morning star hits you, one of the spikes explode into a fog, and the room fills with fog. So everybody will have disadvantage on sight. The area is heavily obscured, which I believe just gives disadvantage. So all attacks going forward have disadvantage. And that is its turn. Leto, it is your turn. Well, that's fun. Uh, he's going to try and just shoot through the fog. So. All right, you have disadvantage. Yep. Yeah, that's a natural one. I can about to roll on the second one. Roll one more time, please. Okay. That's at three. All right. Um, as you shoot a uh, ditch, you hear an arrow shoot directly past your head. Ooh. Don't like that. And second attack. Uh, 22. Or 21. With disadvantage? Yep. Okay, that hits. Yeah, plus 10 to attack. Mm. Uh, 20 more damage. All right. Um, as you dodge out of the way from the first arrow that almost hit you, another arrow ditch runs past the other ear, but this time it thunks into something in front of you. Um, after that, I'm going to try and head towards where Penelope is. And just try and make sure, or at least where I thought she was, and try and make sure she's okay. Okay. And nothing goes towards her. And that would be it. All right. Um, up next is Vivid. Okay. So as far as I know, this thing hasn't moved. That you're aware. Okay. So I'm going to shoot Eldritch Blast for where it was with disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Uh, ooh, I got a 15 and a 16. So that is um, 15 plus 8 to hit. That'll hit. Okie doke. That is uh, 16 plus 5. 21 damage for the first blast. Mm-hmm. And then the second blast, also at disadvantage. Ooh, I got a 17 and an 18. So um, also hits. And that is a total of 15 damage. All right. Um, in the mist of the fog, you hear a thump as something seems to have fallen to the floor. Are you guys all right? I shout out as my free action. The room gets silent and the fog is still filling, filling the room, so it's hard to see. But nothing seems to attack further. I want to rush across the room to where the Olaf was. Okay. And is it on the ground when I get up close to it through the fog? Can I see? Eventually you will make your way there. It takes you about 30 seconds to get there and you are able to find that he is on the ground before you. I want to try to take the mask off of it. Um, make a charisma saving throw. Okay. I'm good at those. Uh, 19? You begin to hear whispers in your head, but you push them aside as you pull the mask off of the person before you. Does it look like a person, like a human, in front of me? It does. I'm gonna- this might be really stupid, guys, but I'm gonna try to cast Revivify, because I'm hoping that this is Charlie and not the Bolov. So that's my- that's my thought process. Just letting you know before I do it. But I'm gonna try to cast Revivify. So, I will say you know that they were undead because okay. Scott and you recognized that earlier. Okay. So it's not but gonna it, work? It looks like a person, but they are not... They were not living minutes ago. Okay. They were unliving. <laughs> and it's been longer than a minute that they've been unliving, so... It's been it 25 be. years since they've right, been Right, so that will not work. Okay, never mind. Um, does it use the spell slot? No. Okay. I'll say that you were thinking about it, and then you're like, wait, didn't Snotty say something about undead earlier? Oh, I wish I had something I could do to fix this, but I'm not strong enough. Snotty, do you have anything that you can do? Um, 
I'm, I'm nowhere near as powerful an arcanist as you. I am. Um, I could. I could try a, a try a restoration magic, perhaps, or uh, or even um lay on hands. But I don't think this is merely a disease or a poison. But I'll give it my best shot. And and I will use five of my lay on hands points to see if it does anything. And if it doesn't do anything, then oh well. Uh, you place your hand on what once was Charlie, and you feel the magic rush through him, but it seems to do nothing on the dead corpse. Um, I'm sorry, Vivid. It's um, it's not working. I don't, I don't think. I think whatever Charlie was is is gone far away. Oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, Penelope. And I'll look over to the corner of the room and give her a little nod. Yeah, how is Penelope doing? She is sobbing in the corner, but not getting any closer. Oh. Somebody please go comfort her. I am the wrong person to do it. Oh, goodness, uh, yes, I, I, I often see people in times of great distress. My, my holy book has, has guided me in, in ways to look after people dis- distressed such as this. And, and I will go over and do, uh, do Snotty's interpretation of comforting, which is... You know, pat- patting and rubbing the back of her hand and telling her things are going to be okay in amongst lots of passages read from his holy book, which is helpful for some folks, not others. It's not fair. It wasn't his fault. It was the town. And I'm going to try to break the mess. Okay, I need you to make a constitution soon. Oh, not good to those. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, 18. Okay. You go to attempt to break the mask, and you feel cold begin to shoot up your arms, almost painfully so. Because you succeeded, you don't take the full damage. Okay. You take eight cold damage. Oof. Chilly. And you drop the mask. Okay. And it's not broken. It, it is not broken. Okay. Can I do, like, an arcana check or something on the mask to see what its deal is? Sure. Ugh. Fucking terrible. Seven. Uh, you don't understand why it's magical. It looks just like a normal Halloween or Hallow Eve's mask that children- or Hall- the Hollow Knight mask that children wear. Hmm. All right, and is there anything else I can, like, glean about the body? You see that Charlie lays on moving, but as you guys have been studying it, he starts to twitch again. As soon as he starts moving, I'm going to try to grab the Morning Star. Okay. Um, also, seeing him twitch, I would like to cat. Well, it's not cast use the paladin's divine sense ability and so i can yet again detect good and evil which is uh, my mo for this game um you, you still sense undead oh no uh, is it coming from the body or the mask it's coming from the body <gasps> uh, 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 so step back if you know what's good for you uh, there's still on on death coming from that thing i shoot it again. Yeah, Vivid, you might want to back up. Well, I have one more thing I want to try. And I'm using the... This is a, a cantrip I have... Oh, wait, no, it's a spell. Is it on my... Yes, it is on my spell list. Um, did I get it, though? Nope, never mind. I did that wrong. Never mind. Don't have anything I want to try. And I back up. Let him make your shot. Is that disadvantage because he's still prone? That's a myth. Bitch, would you like to attempt anything before he stands? Yeah. Was I able to get the Morning Star from him? Yes. Wonderful. Since he's prone, I'm gonna try to whap him with his own Morning Star. Um, and since he's prone, I'd get advantage. Right? Okay. Add plus two to whatever you roll. Dope. Um. Oh well. One of them fell off the table, but the other one was a nat twenty. Very nice. Uh, so that's 2d8. You don't need to roll. How do you want to do this? Oh, wonderful. Um, I 
uh, apologies to Penelope, but I would love to... Uh, um, snotty, snotty will like stand in front of her so she can't see, don't worry, so that you can have full reign of this moment. Yeah, I mean, it It would be easier to do this with my battle axe than with a morning star, but I would love to separate the head from the body. Alright, you successfully do so, and it is as bloody as you can imagine. Does it look like it's gonna stand back up? It does not. Um, Penelope is over talking to Snotty, but Snotty gets distracted when he is focused on the Balav reanimating, and Penelope somehow managed to sneak around Snotty and is sitting next to the mask. She holds it in her hand as she grips it, tears streaming down her face, and she just says, as she locks eyes on Snotty, as you realize that she's no longer behind you. I- I'm sorry, I can't- I can't control it. Don't you put that mask- don't put it on, don't put it on! She raises the mask to her face. <laughs> the shape of a dark shadow stands mm. over her. Mm. A thin, seemingly humanoid figure with long, gangly arms protruding from the fingers. Then fleshy strings pull the mask closer to Samantha. It seems the creature that had Charlie has moved on to a new quarry. The darkness fills the room around you. You frantically rush to where Penelope was, but as the light fades back into the room, she is gone. You spend the next few hours searching the town high and low before you conclude that she is not here anymore. The sheriff, despite not believing, is thankful for your aid and gives you a complimentary night's stay at the Lonely Maiden. And you hear victorious yet somber words on the wind that say the Balav lives again. And that is where it will end. But I'm not staying in that town again. <laughs> town's curse. Oh, that was so much fun. Whole town's curse. Burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun, though. Yeah. I, I was upset that I was rolling like ass the whole time, but I got a nat 20 at the end, so I feel like that made up for it. Yeah, um, sorry about, like, streamlining it a little bit, but it's like, this is a five to seven hour game. I'm like, nope. (laughs) Not today. I mean, like (laughs) I said, I would have been happy to play five hours, but this was so much fun as it was. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks thanks for a really great adventure. I think, I think, streamlined or not, it was, I had a really great time. And... I love the horror trope of, like, the evil will return. (laughs) And thank you, Prue, for last minute joining. Oh, it's okay. I love uh, the Dungeons and Dragons. I love spooky things. I like goblins. (laughs) Always a win. Um, Now, everybody, please go check out below for details on where you can find these lovely humans and goblins. And um, you... You can also check us out on Facebook or Twitter at Beholders No One or wherever podcasts can be found. Um, or if you want specific details on Beholders No One.com. Happy Halloween, everybody. I hope you had a great one. Bye.